The Sundance Central is made up of 41 separate modules and takes up about 1,600 square feet of floor space. The year and locale of the layout is intentionally vague and that allows the members plenty of creativity for their freelance models. This is probably uh, late 30s, early 40s, somewhere out in Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico area. A little more on the desert side than on the uh, forest greenery side. A railroad that would have existed that may have joined the Denver and Rio Grande to some other railroad and it would have been a little spur thing all by itself and had maybe had a logging line associated with it and some other different industries that could contribute to its traffic. And it just was a run on a shoestring and maintenance was we'll get it manana and uh, it's, if it was falling down, it's probably going to get more falling down as time goes on because the maintenance was just non-existent. Well, then it just kind of got by with what it could get by with and made do. The other thing that, that MLW, DeFasco, and uh, Alcan wanted was a train that banked like the turbo did. But they didn't want to use a gravity pendulum system. They opted for um, a servo hydraulic banking system that as the coach and the locomotive went into a curve, sensors would record the degree of the curve and tip the car hydraulically to the angle that was appropriate to give a comfortable ride. And it was that feature which would become one of the LRC's greatest problems once it eventually went into service. So once I realized this wasn't providing me with any enjoyment and was providing me mostly with anguish, that was a pretty small leap. And then after two years of not being used, then I realized, oh my God, now I got to go back and I got to clean all the track and you know, on and on and on. So then it became like, well, that's it. We're done. We got to move on. Taking it down has been a heart-wrenching experience. And I guess I wasn't ready for that part. You know, it's just difficult because I like building it. And some of it is really good. There's parts of it that aren't as good as others, but there's parts where I got started to get my modeling started getting better and better. And there's parts of it that are really, really good. In addition to that, this little unit on the end is what we've been talking about, this gizmo, as I'll call it, the keep alive. Mm -hmm. You guys have pioneered this and uh, made it very easy and very accessible. I think we should talk to our viewers oh. about what it does. Be glad to. All right. Yes. Maybe we can demonstrate uh, how that works on the models. Why don't we do that? We'll give okay. a demonstration of how it works and the benefit of it to start out with. And then we'll get into uh, a little bit more of the technical stuff of how it actually works. Perfect. So, John, why don't you take us up to about speed step 10. Okay, wait for that pump to go off. Now we're using an NCE power cab here for our demonstration for our command station. So when I unplug this, the track will be dead. No power on the track now. So as you can see, the sound lasted several seconds and the motor actually went for about five, six seconds. And then of course you'll uh, switch that one back and then you head back. It was quite a lot of fun watching them uh, trying to muddle their way through uh, an operating <laughs> session when they hadn't ever experienced switching. <laughs> this, is, this is all a mystery to me. Don't we? You want to drop the Ontario Northland? For example, when you have to take a, uh, a locomotive and pull a car out of a siding and then run around to the other end and put it on your train, well, most likely they hadn't done that before. Okay, so that one and that one are dropping and we're picking up the flat down there. Yeah. Okay, bring it back and you'll be onto that siding. Well, the big part of this is the problem solving. How to separate and rejoin a train. Of the uh, 111, the very back one. We're dropping it? Yep. 
Gail has built several structures for the layout. This is actually her first effort. She's also done a fine job on the Bar Mills Wicked Wanda's kit. So Gail and I both work on the railroad together. Uh, we actually bought a two-person's table so we could actually sit at night and model. We use the TV just for noise. We make a lot of decisions together about the future of the railroad instead of me just making all the decisions if I was doing it by myself. What kits we're going to buy. I don't have to hide what I'm buying. I can bring it in without changing the price tag. FT-103 has an audience waiting, so for John and his crew, this wash job is good enough. It's as clean as it's gonna be. <laughs> and so, the last of the 26 streamliners joins the others at the roundhouse. The gates are open. The museum is expecting about 5,000 visitors over the next four days, with guests paying around $40 for a day pass. Streamliners at Spencer has attracted fans from around the United States, as well as five foreign countries. It seems as though everyone here has their own personal Streamliner story. You know, like almost everybody of the boomer age, my, mine started with uh, my first train set, which was an American flyer, and it just so happened that that train set was a New Haven in that exact paint scheme of that locomotive sitting over there. So uh, that locomotive is a little special to me. Trainmasters TV, only from Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine.